Hallelujah. Why don't you put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. 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 As Mama and them used to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then we're proceeding the song, and let us go, let us go, let us go. Let us go, let us go, let us go. Let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you are thankful for being in the house of the Lord on today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but the frigid temperatures don't do good for these bones of mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes they're achy, sometimes they still, sometimes they want to do what they want to do. So that's when you got to pray and say, body, I command you today. You got to bring that flesh under subjection. Hallelujah. Because today is the day that the Lord has made. Hallelujah. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. It don't matter about how cold it is outside. I'm still here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as they say in Chicago, that's a fact jack. Hallelujah. 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 You know, I like to have fun in the Lord. Hallelujah. I like to be happy. I like to be glad. Hallelujah. The Bible told me so. Hallelujah. The Bible said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yes. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is him that has made us and not we ourselves. Yes. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible tells me. Hallelujah. It tells me to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. How many of you are thankful for something on today? I'm thankful for it all. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything I'm thankful for. It. Hallelujah. I might not be able to lift my hands as high as you can, but we all can do something, oh God. The God has given us the activities, our limbs on today. We serve a God that's big, that's mighty, and that just so happened to be the theme for this year, we got the capital B to the I to the G. Hallelujah. That's the type of God that we serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here we go. My God is big, so strong.
because you serve a God that is big, that is strong, that is mighty. And that when you face situations, trials, and circumstances, those things that are just situations in your life, that there's nothing that's too hard for him. And because you were created as an image and likeness, there's nothing too hard for you. You may just have to go through some things, but in the end, you got the victory. In the end, you got the victory. Victory only happens in him. So in the end, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, you got the victory. And when I think about that victory, I think about my mom. Because early on in her battle, we had a conversation. And the conversation went like this. I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to fight. I said, well, I'm fighting with you. Amen. And then I told her, because you say it and you love the Lord, no matter what happens, you're going to obtain the victory. Oh, y'all don't understand this. Y'all don't understand this. No matter what happens, you're going to obtain the victory. And for those who are not in a relationship with God, they might not understand. But see, I understood that no matter what happens, the victory was going to be hers. She was going to be able to shout, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Victory was going to take place no matter what happens. So if the Lord cured her from cancer here for us, victory happened. But see, she didn't get that victory. She got the other victory, the one that we all long for. The victory of God said, that's it. It's over with. Come with me. She got the optimal, the optimal victory. The best victory that anybody will want to have. The victory where he says, come be with me. Victory, I got it. That's what we got to understand. I thank God. I got no matter what the situation you're going through. Victory, I got it. You might not like it at that moment. I thank God. I got it. I don't like sitting up here. Victory, I got it. With two torn rotator cups. I thank God. I got it. I can't lift my hands all the way. Victory, But I'm still here. So with the two torn rotator cups. saying that's what I heard that's what I read he's my fortress hallelujah and he holds everything in the palm of his hands so that's the type of understanding that we have to come to that he holds everything in his hands to those who are in a relationship with him now I know at times it seems like those that are not in a relationship with him often get and obtain and are lucrative and blessed and highly favored. But that's what it may seem like. Because we not all know, we not all seeing, we don't know these things. We don't know the beginning of something from the end. We don't know infinity. We don't know that. All we know is what's in front of us. Unless God drops a revelation in your spirit. But I can only take for face value what I got. And I know that if I'm going through something, I can trust and depend on the Lord. I believe in my heart that the Lord saved me. And I believe that this relationship is going to last as long as I do my part. So it's on my part that I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. That means that I'm supposed to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. That means worship him. Come before his presence with singing. It doesn't matter if one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people are in the place. Come before his presence with singing. It's about what you're going to do. 
What you going to do? Not what I'm going to What you going to do? I'm going to come before his presence with singing. I'm going to know that the Lord created me in his image and his likeness. So therefore, I'm going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And I'm going to go into his courts with praise. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to be thankful for it all. That's what I'm going to do. And in the meantime, in between time, any time, I'm going to praise him. And I'm going to press into his presence. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to press into his presence. Pressing into his presence. Hallelujah. That's what I'm going to do. Because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. our hands all over the building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to press in his presence this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to press in your presence. Oh. If I can just press, press in your presence and leave everything behind. If I could just press, press in your presence and leave all my cares behind me. If I could just press, yes, press in your presence and leave all my cares behind me. Home, I still believe I will just lay, lay at your feet. I will be whole. I still believe I will just lay, lay at your feet right here in your presence. Oh, right here. If I can just press, yeah. press in your presence and never leave this place again. If I could press, press, press in, press in your presence and leave all my cares behind me. I will be whole. I will be whole. I do believe. I still believe. I'm going to lay at your feet.
me. I give you me. I give you me. You own this world, but yet and still you want me, Jesus. You still want me, Lord. I give you me. You call me your own. You call me your own, oh God. Oh Lord, oh Lord. I give you me. 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 scripture in Romans when it tells us to present our bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord holy and acceptable which is our reasonable act of worship and in the corresponding the song we was presenting our bodies to the Lord in the song and it was like take my heart oh God take my mind oh God take my soul and never let me go hallelujah and when we talk about the mind and we talk about the heart and we talk about the soul, those three objects are interchangeable. They're interchangeable because they all relate to one another. So we're talking about presenting our bodies as living sacrifices unto God, holy and acceptable. The main components that will cause us not to be a worthy sacrifice are our mind, our heart, ultimately our soul. So today, oh God, take my mind, take my heart, take my soul and never let it. Yes. Take my heart, take my mind, take my soul, never let me go. Take my heart. That's our prayer this morning. Take my mind, take my soul, never let me go. You should be able to articulate that to the Lord on your own as you present your body today as a living sacrifice. Talk to your God. Take my heart, take my mind, take my soul, never let me go. It belongs to you, God. Here I am, oh God. Here I am, oh God. I give you Hallelujah. I give you me. This heart, oh God, this mind, and this soul, oh God, I give it to you. I give you me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I give you me. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Bless the Lord with all that is within you. Give the Lord a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is worthy. Hallelujah. We serve a God that is so worthy, so worthy, so worthy. In the instances of things that may be minute, that are small, it's the little things that sometimes we don't want to give God thanks for just the little minute details. The ability to walk downstairs, 
the ability to open up your mouth and breathe and enunciate words and articulate, the ability to think and be clothed in your right mind. It's the little things, the little things. It's the little things. It's not the big things, it's the little things that sometimes we just say like, oh, but nothing is due to you. So I thank God for the little minute things. Father God, I just thank you right now because you're worthy, oh God. Not because you even did the little things, just because you are worthy alone. Hallelujah. Real simple worship song. Real simple. But the words, listen. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, O God. Worthy is your name. The name that is higher than any name. Jesus. Cause at the mention of your name. You deserve the praise. Hallelujah. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Hallelujah. Jesus. You alone deserve the praise. You deserve the praise. Here it is, oh God. Worthy is One more time. Your name. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the
standing here, God, and we're thankful, oh God. You didn't have to do it, but you did, oh God. So, Father God, we know that you are worthy of the praise, oh God, worthy of the glory, worthy of the honor, oh God. It all belongeth unto you, oh God. So, Father God, right now, in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, God, we thank you right now, oh God, for keeping us safe from all hurt, harm, and danger, oh God, for allowing us to be in your presence, oh God, just to praise your name, oh God, to worship you, oh God, to be thankful, oh God, to Enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts of praise and present our whole entire bodies as sacrifices unto you, O oh God. So, Father God, we just thank you right now, O oh God. Father God, we ask that you bless the furtherment of the service, O oh God. Open our minds and our understandings, O oh God, as we prepare, O oh God, to receive the vision for the year, O oh God. Harden out our hearts, O oh God. Keep us, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh God. Let what's being articulated and what's being spoken and what's being said be received, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God, that it may be applicable to us, oh God. Father God, we just thank you right now, oh God. We could never give your name enough praise, oh God. If we had 10,001 tongues, oh God, we couldn't do it, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise, worthy, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve the praise, worthy is your name, hallelujah. So let's make it a big year, amen. I'm so glad we all agreed to the, that this is our vision, amen? This is our ministry, and we're all going to participate, amen? Praise God. So get your offering in your hand, and we're not going to do an offering confession. We're going to do a different confession today. Get your offering in your hand. Matter of fact, get your purchase means in your hand. Put, reach in your purse, get your bank card, your checkbook, Get it in your hand. I'm not, I'm not asking you to give anything. This is no gimmick right here. I want to pray over that purchase means. I want to pray over that purchase means. I want to pray, Keisha, that whatever purchase means you go out, God increases that exponentially. That's right. I want to pray that God increases that exponentially. Amen. Get your checkbook. I want to pray that God gives you increase. Amen. Increase in many different ways, promotions, blessings, I want to pray for your payment means. Amen? Amen. Father, as we lift these payment means before you, God, we pray that you bless your people, God, that they may be able to bring into the storehouse that which is meat, that which is needed, God, and that there may be meat on your table, God, that we can prove you in this, test you in this, and see if you will not throw open the windows of heaven and pour them out of blessings. So, God, I pray for these bank accounts. I pray for these accounts that are represented to see increase this year. God, I pray, God, that you supernaturally 
bring resources into their hands, God. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, we pray a blessing over your people as they have committed, Lord God, to this vision, as they have committed to this uh, uh, church this year to support the ministry that you have called us together to accomplish. And so I pray you bless them so that they might be a blessing, not just to the church, God, but to those in need around them, to family members that have need. God, I pray that you would increase their storehouse so they may be generous on every occasion. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Let's bless the Lord with our offering. As we're standing all over the building, we're going to prepare our hearts to receive the word. And God, we thank you for the vision. We thank you, Lord. And we worship you, O God. In the beauty of holiness, O God. We thank you, O God. I worship you, Lord. For
love you, Lord. Come on. Come on. For holy is your name. I worship you, Lord. And to the world I will proclaim. You sent your one and only Son. This life has already. For me, and by the power of His blood, I am forgiven and set free. I thank you, Lord. among the dead was so disruptive 
the dead folk came out of the grave. When Jesus came into the grave, the dead said, I got to get out of here. It was, it was too much power where the dead couldn't remain dead. Jesus. Something about the name. Something about the name. Jesus. It's Mary's little baby. Jesus. The cop is the son. Jesus. The one who opened the blind eyes, Jesus. The one who called Lazarus from the grave by name, Jesus. The one who walked on water, Jesus. The one who sent word to heal the centurion's servant, Jesus. The one whose garment, the woman that had the issue of blood, touched Jesus. Jesus. The one who said that if you ask anything in my, in my name, I'm going to ask the Father to give it to you. Jesus. One grandmama told me about the one mama used to pray to, the one that saved my soul one day, Jesus. The one that Paul said knew no sin but became sin for me, Jesus. The one who did nothing wrong but got charged for everything wrong. Jesus. The one whose stripes I'm healed. That Jesus. The one who answered heaven's call for justice. Hung on the cross. Because I was to be punished, Jesus. The one who lived his short life thinking about nothing but the cross. He wasn't planning to marry. He wasn't planning to have a family. He wasn't planning to live a long life. He had no plans of amassing wealth. He just wanted to die on the cross. Jesus. 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 Father, we thank you for such a sacrifice. To wrap your son who was with you before the beginning in a panoply of flesh and send him so far beneath his station in eternity to walk in this weak flesh for me, for us. to die my death to pay my penalty so that I could go free and even now God he forever lives to make intercession for me he's still praying for me God I thank you 
I thank you, God, for your sacrifice. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Oh, God, I worship you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless us now, God. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Glory to God. Man, I, I just want to thank the praise team for their dedication. I know they got the month off and they're not having rehearsals, but what is evident is that they are still worshiping. Amen, somebody? And so I thank you all for your commitment to open the floodgates of heaven for us as a congregation. One thing you don't get here when we come together and and worship is form and fashion. We We don't mind being disruptive in our worship, do we, Garnell? We don't mind getting stuck on the name of Jesus. You know, some places are so committed to how we do what we do that they never leave room for God to do what he wants to do. Amen, somebody? Now, I can preach any time. I try to be ready to preach all the time. Sometimes I'm not even preaching the word of God, but give me a subject and I can preach it. But sometimes it's okay to just let God be God. And, you know, I, I worship and, I, and I, I, I put forth all that energy because I'm messed up. <laughs> don't, don't let my worship make you think I had a good week. Don't get fooled by it and think, oh, God, he, would, he loved the Lord. He heard his cry and pitied his every groan. No, 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 no. I worship the way I worship because I'm the biggest crack pot in here. And I need the presence of the Lord. And the word tells me that if I praise him, he'll come near. He comes near to the brokenhearted. Are you listening to me? So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I worship like that because I need the Lord. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, by the way, that song was an original Sign of the Dove song. I, I know you thought Kirk Franklin and the family did that, but no, that, that came, that originated in our ministries. Amen? That was, that was our original. In fact, we should just have a Sunday of doing all of our originals, you know. Because, I mean, that song came from the heart of worship. We didn't see that out on the Internet and get the license to do it. We, that came out of us. In fact, on the original CD, uh, Pastor Bow is the lead singer on that song. Praise Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, and then, then if you need a head start, go ahead and put your thumb on Matthew chapter 7. And this is part two of a message we started last week entitled, You're Built to Last and Not Break. And we're dealing with our subject of build, increase, and grow. And the first thing that has to be clear is that you were built to last and not break. And I want to expand that today to say we were built to last and not break. Amen, somebody? And, and, if, and, and if you can get this message today in your spirit and let this message put you where God would have you to be, guarantee you this year is going to be a great year for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Say amen when you get there. Say hold up if you need more time. Hold up. Praise Jesus. 
Everybody there now? Amen. All right. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building joined and held together rises to become a temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are built together to become a dwelling in which Christ lives by his spirit. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to look at verse 24. I'm just going to read two quick verses and then you can take your seat. Matthew chapter 7. Praise Jesus. Verse 24 says this. No, no, that's the wrong one. All right, here we go. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The wind, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Thank you. You may be seated. You are built to last and not break. We were built to last and not break. Paul in the text gives us three critical metaphors to help us understand the strength of our relationship, our redemptive relationship in Christ. The first one he says is that we are citizens, right, of the kingdom, which implies we now have certain rights and privileges afforded to us by the sovereignty of the kingdom in which we are citizens. We now have the protection of the sovereign uh, government that we are citizens of. Then he went a little deeper and he said, but you're also members of God's household, family members, children, right? And, but now he gets to the final um, 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 level of our relationship related to our redemptive relationship with God and its endurability as a building or temple. His final illustration or his final metaphor that deals with our redemptive relationship both individually and collectively. Now, I really want to transition to this, this collaborative understanding of the text, all right? I don't want you to understand the text simply as it applies to you. I want you to expand your thinking to understand the text now as it applies to us. Somebody say us. Somebody say we. Somebody say our. Yeah. Because that's what God has created. He's created a collaborative, amen? He's created a congregant experience for us. Not an individual experience, but a congregate experience. He wants to do something in us collectively. Amen, somebody. Praise Jesus. So he uses this final illustration as the building and the temple. And he starts by saying in verse 20 that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, I want you to note the order, the apostles and the prophets, because some theologians argue that he's not necessarily talking about Old Testament prophets as much as he's talking about the New Testament prophets. So he lists them not in the order of their traditional occurrence, the prophets came before the apostles, but he lists them as apostles and prophets. So one theolog theological perspective is that he's talking about the New Testament apostles and the New Testament prophets, but he could be talking about the fact that the apostles are here now in the dispensation of the church built upon the work of the prophets who were here beforehand. Amen? But either way, he's talking about those oracles of God who proclaim the word of God. This is a reference to the prophetic and revelatory words spoken through the apostles and the prophets to form and develop the church's foundation. So notice that he says at the foundation of the building, he says that we're built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. So we're all built on the foundations of the proclaimed word. Amen? Whether it came through a prophetic utterance, as we are doing and experiencing now, or it came through an apostolic work or utterance. Amen? He says that they're built on the foundation of God's prophetic word or his proclaimed word. Now, the biblical metaphor of, of Christ as a temple or building reaches its full perfection in this particular passage because there are other passages, and we'll look at some of those, but there are other passages where it used as an illustration Christ as a building. Now, 
maybe after this message, we'll explore the illustration of Christ as a body again, because he's trying to get us to understand that Christ is building something. Amen, somebody? And, and we all are part of that which he is building. So this metaphor of him as a building or a temple reaches its perfection in this passage. It's interesting to note that, is, that the apostles and the prophets are the foundation, not Jesus. Hallelujah. It, it's interesting to note that Paul says that it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We'll get to that in a minute, but we have to understand that every time we hear prophetic word, every time we hear prophetic utterance, there's a building process that is going on. And God says the foundation of his church is the apostles and the prophets, the word of God that was proclaimed. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Amen? It starts from the image that we see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus says, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So now Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on this rock. And Paul says that he's the chief cornerstone or the chief rock of the building, but the apostles are the foundation. Amen? All right, let's keep going. The ideal of growth and development of building, of the building of God by addition and joining together other stones is lost in this myoptic approach that many take of their relationship with Christ. Now, I want to expand how you think about your salvation. Because the idea of growth and development of the house of God with addition and the joining together of other stones gets lost in this myoptic approach we have to our relationship with God. In other words, we tend to think about our relationship with God and its effects solely about me. Amen, somebody? And we lose the fact that God is not building you, he's building a house. Amen, somebody? And in the process, your connection to that house impacts you as an individual member in the house, but understand something, you not the house. Amen, somebody? So what God is building is inclusive of you, but not exclusive of all others. You get me? In other words, you're a part, but you're only a part if you're a part. You can't be a part and be a part. You can't be apart from the house and be a part of the house because God is not building individual bricks. He's not building individual stones, but he's using individual stones to build himself a house. And, and, and this illustration of what God is building gets lost when we take on this myoptic approach to our salvation and we think that God is about us and all my life is just about God. But we don't realize that whatever God is doing in Brenda, he's doing in Brenda for somebody else. That the strength and the magnitude of what God is doing in Shawanda can only be seen when Shawanda is connected to the house. But if you take a piece out of my house, separate it from my house, and set it on my driveway, it's no longer part of my house. Because it no longer contributes to the strength, viability, and functionality of the house. A toilet is what it is meant to be when it's in a house connected to the plumbing system that takes the waste out of the house and into the sewage. Take the same toilet and put it on the driveway, and guess what? The house can't function. Because I don't know about you, I'm not going to be sitting on my driveway So the toilet only has relevance when it's connected to the house. I'll be the toilet for sake of the illustration. 
I may just be a toilet, but guess what? You need me in the house. Oh, come on, somebody. Because sometimes we think because I'm not the most glamorous part that I'm not really needed in the house. Now, I don't sit down and, and spend a couple of hours in the evening just staring at my toilet. Oh, my God, this is a beautiful toilet, Pastor Andy picked out. I'm just going to spend the evening in his bathroom on the toilet, on the toilet looking at the toilet. No, I don't. The toilet is insignificant. I don't care about the toilet until. And I don't need to realize when I need the toilet that somebody done took the toilet and put it on the driveway. Are you getting me now? So Jesus is building a house. And this gets distorted because we have this myopic approach to our relationship with God. Many folks are trying to have a relationship with God that is related to or connected, that is, I'm sorry, that is not related to or connected to anyone but God. In other words, there are some people that think all I need is God. That's all I need. I don't need you. I need God. All I need is God. Amen. If I got God, I got everything I need. Praise Jesus. Well, that's just not biblical. Because in Ephesians, he says that the body builds and grows itself up as each member supplies. He says that, 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 that all the members together form one body. You, you can't just function by yourself. But there are many trying to have a relationship with God only outside the building or the collaborative that he's building. Amen, somebody? Now, watch this. Watch this. I'm going to be very intentional in, in this teaching because I want you to get this. Now, when God saved you, there should have been collateral, collateral and collaborative connections that are beneficial to the building of God's church. He saved you, and as a result of being saved, there should be collateral and collaborative connections that are beneficial both to you and the building of God's church. In other words, he didn't save you so you can be by yourself. But he saved you for collateral and collaborative benefit. Like, I'm better because you here. I I'm better because God saved you. And I'm reaping the benefits of your salvation. As you should be reaping the benefits of my salvation. But what he did not do is save you just to save you. Amen, somebody? Somebody say we. Somebody say us. Yeah, we were built to last and not break. So then the builder of a house has to be able to see the individual parts as they collaborate with the other parts and not as standalone parts. So let me tell you something. You, you ever been, anybody ever been to the, the, the Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards? Isn't it, it beautiful when you go in there and you see the, all the lighting hanging up and the chandeliers hanging down. And uh, isn't it beautiful when you go through a, a place and you see all these individual material? Oh, I would love to have this type of flooring on the floor in the house. And, oh, my God, I would love to have these fixtures in the bathroom. And you're going through. And let's say you pick all of that stuff out as individual parts. You just you went to the plumbing and you fell in love with certain plumbing. You bought the individual pieces, and you went to the flooring, and you saw the flooring you wanted to have. This is what I want to have in the kitchen. This is what I want to have in the great room, and you picked it all out. And then you went to the next department, and you picked it all out. And then you had Home Depot to deliver all that stuff to your house on pallets on your driveway. What do you have? You got a bunch of stuff on pallets in the driveway that doesn't make any sense unless you can see it together. 
And as the parts start to get built one upon the next, guess what starts to form? Something you can live in. Something that's viable to you. Something that's going to protect you. Something that's going to house you. Something that's going to give you a place for your family to dwell. That's what God is building. But for a builder to build, it has to be able to see the collaborative and the consequential benefits of all the individual parts together. Not just the individual parts. Amen, somebody? Paul goes on to say, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone, the apostles and prophets, the preachers, and proclaimers of the word of God are the foundation, but Christ is the chief cornerstone. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, this is an interesting word because he's not just the cornerstone because a building will have at every corner a, a cornerstone. But Christ is the chief cornerstone, meaning that that cornerstone is laid. A lot of good things about that cornerstone because it's laid first. That cornerstone is different materials from all the other build, building materials. In other words, all the stones that are built upon the cornerstone are not the same. The cornerstone oftentimes is a long stone that goes deep into the ground and is put in the ground. And then everything that forms the building from the foundation up is derived from its connection to the cornerstone. So even if you put the cornerstone down, but the building connects around the cornerstone, but it's not connected to the cornerstone, it's not going to stand. Amen? The cornerstone, here's what the word cornerstone means. It's the basic part of something. The cornerstone is often made of a different material from the rest of the building. It's the essential element for a building. The cornerstone is laid first, and then the entire structure is built from that cornerstone, specifically the chief cornerstone, which connects and anchors the foundation and two of its walls. So I want you to imagine a building being built. The chief cornerstone is laid. The foundation is connected from that chief cornerstone and spreads out. But then there are two walls that are the anchor of that building that are built on that cornerstone. Now, the other walls that are going to be built are going to connect to those walls. They'll have a cornerstone, but it won't be as important as that chief cornerstone. Are you with me now? Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the prophets and the apostles being the foundation, but now God starts to build upward. With every stone, with every soul that's saved, God starts to build his house. Are you listening to me? So back then to this myoptic view, this, this individual approach uh, to our, our position and functioning in the temple of God, simply put, it's destructive. Say destructive. You see these brick walls up here? When we start to move bricks from that wall and the integrity of that wall starts to decline. The weight it can bear starts to decline. Because with every missing part, the destruction is inevitable. Amen, somebody? Now, you can take a boulder and just plumb it through the wall and destroy it quickly. But oftentimes, that's not how the devil destroys the house of God. He don't just come through with a boulder. What he does is he starts picking at individual pieces. And, and the reason we're so easily removed is because we see our, our relationship in Christ through a myoptic lens, my relationship with Christ. No, 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 no. Your relationship with Christ is a part of our relationship with Christ. Oh, come on, somebody. It's, it's, like, it's like you got four kids. You don't describe your family by just describing one of your children, do you? Oh, you know, I got four kids. Well, tell me about your family. Well, me and John. Yeah, we have a great family. Me and John, 
we have a great family. Me and John, we love spending time together. Me and John, well, I thought you said you had four kids. But you're only talking about one. Now, God would never do that, but sometimes we do that. We act like we're the only child. Sometimes we act like we're the building. But, God, but, but Paul says that God is not building himself a brick to live in. He's building himself a house to live in. Watch this, watch this, watch this. You teaching, Bridget. You teaching me something. Watch this, watch this. This myoptic individual approach to our positioning and functioning in the temple or the church of Jesus Christ is destructive. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, or chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This, this, this myoptic perspective that, 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 you know, God is working on me, God is doing the work in me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on me and my relationship with God, and I'm not going to really concern myself with the bigger picture, the collaborative picture, uh, uh, the, the collateral benefits. I'm not going to focus on the congregate perspective. This is about me and my house. No, this is about us and God's house. Your salvation is not about you and your house. Your salvation is about us and God's house. It's in the Bible. Romans 12 says that just as the body has many members, but one body, so in Christ we who are members form one body. We who are many form one body. So we don't have the body of Christ in you. We have the body of Christ in us. No more than we have the church of Christ in me or in you. We have the church of Christ in us. Look at what 1 Corinthians says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you there? I want you to look at verse 9 and then we'll go down to verse 16. It says, for we are God's, we, not me, we, we is one of those what? Congregate words, those collaborative words, the, the, those, those, those words that are not personal and, 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 and they're not personal pronouns. It's, it's us, speaking of the, 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 the plural, not the singular. And we are, we are co-workers of God's service. You are God's fields and God's building. Now, go down to verse 16. I love this clarification that Paul makes. Don't you know that you yourselves... Not you yourself. Don't you know that you yourselves, sign of the dove, are God's temple? Don't you know that you yourselves? Now, if he was just talking about Keisha, he would have said something like, do you not know that you yourself? But if I say, Keisha, I'm talking in this general direction, I said, do you not know that you yourselves do you take that as I'm just talking to you? No, I'm talking to a collaborative. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3. I'm sorry, I did say 1. I'm sorry. Chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you yourselves are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in your midst? Where does the Spirit of God dwell? Do you not know that we, ourselves, we're the temple of God, and the temple and the Spirit of God dwells in our midst. There's a manifestation and an articulation of His Spirit in Keisha, in Kenny, in Denise, in Clarence, in Matthias, in Garnell. And His Spirit is dwelling in our midst. And I'm going to miss a part of His Spirit if part of we ourselves are not present. God built this thing to last and not break. Watch this. If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. 
You together are that temple. You know, sometimes we get a move and we get away from church, and then we wonder why, you know, the further we get away, the further we get away, and then things start happening bad. And you know one of the first revelations that come to us? I need to get back to where I belong. Because you're realizing that you were not built to be separate. You were built to be a part of the house that God is building. And God says I, I, it's destructive to not be in the house, to not be a part of the house. Amen, somebody? First thing we got to get if we're going to get build, increase, and growth this year is to realize my position in God. Amen? Paul goes on to say that in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. Your relevance, now I want to say this, in him, the whole building rises to become, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So your relevance then is found in him and in the building. Because in him, we're built together and we rise to become a holy temple. So the relevance of me as an individual born again, spirit-filled believer is in him and in the building that he's building. The minute I'm no longer in him, I'm no longer part of the building. The, member, the minute I'm no longer in the building, I'm no longer part of him because he is building a building for himself. It's interesting how, you know, you meet people and I, I always correct people when I meet them and they say, well, you know, I'm not going to church. And, uh, and, uh, they, but they, they still feel like they love the Lord and they're Christians. And, and I'm not saying that they're not Christians. They do love the Lord and that God is still talking to them. But you better get into church because he didn't make you to be it. He made us to be it. You don't think if I could go this thing alone, I would be tempted to go this thing alone, but I can't. I'm just a little bitty stone tucked away somewhere in that house that God is building. And he built this thing to last, but I got to realize that I'm a part of his strength. Amen, somebody? He says, in him, the whole building is joined together. Somebody say joined together. Now, now, in him, the whole building is joined together. What that tells me is, Teresa, is that when I give my life to Christ, Christ has something he wants to connect me to. And the something he wants to connect me to is not me. I can't walk around with this. I don't need nobody else because I got Christ and I'm connected to me in Christ. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in him, we were all being joined together. We were all being joined together. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm connected to you. I want to tell somebody like you, you mean it, huh? I'm connected to you. I'm connected to you. I can't just forget about your existence. I can't even just forget about your non-existence. Because I'm connected to you. And if you're missing, there's, if God has joined us together and you just happen to be the stone that he connected next to me and you're missing, then there's a part of me exposed. Hallelujah. Watch this, watch this. We in him are all being joined together to become or to rise to become a holy temple. Let me say this. You have to be joined together before you can rise to become. In other words, there's no growth as an individual member. There's only growth in the collective or the collaborative. Because what God is doing is building something, and you're part of the growth and the building that he's building. Amen, somebody? And when you're joined and connected. Now, I want you to think about how this process works because, you know, and I'll get there in a minute or maybe next week, but, you know, the Bible talks about 
uh, in First Peter, and we'll go there in a little bit, about living stones. You two are living stones being built together. Now, you see those bricks? And if you notice in those bricks, they, they want to break up the um, pattern. And, and they do it for strength as well. But you notice how this brick is here, and then these two bricks overlap, and then this brick is in the center, and these two bricks overlap. But if you follow this line, every other brick, it lines up. There's some, there's some, there's some uniformity to what appears to not be uniform. It's pretty easy to build with bricks. You, anybody, when you were a kid, ever had Legos? Okay, wait a minute. Anybody as an adult ever play with your kids' Legos? <laughs> okay. So it's really easy. And in a way, it's frustrating because you can't bend the Legos if you want to make a curve or a corner, right? Everything's going to be square. But it's easy because you just stack one brick upon the other. And that's the easy way to build. God doesn't use bricks. He uses stones. And stones are a little more difficult to build with because no stone is like the other stone. And depending on you, the stone, you might not necessarily like the other stone. Because Keisha, the other stone may have, it may have a pointy elbow, right? And I don't know why God put you next to me, but you're going to have to get up off me, right? But God's building with stones, and sometimes we don't always like the way he fit and join us together. Because, see, every stone has its own perfections, and every stone has its own imperfections. And so if you're building with bricks, you just keep stacking bricks. You ever seen brick layers? They just stacking bricks. All the bricks are delivered to the site. They're on a nice pallet. They got wire around them, and it's nice and square. And they just go to the pallet and keep stacking bricks. But the stone builder, he's got a tool belt on. And he's got different tools to get different responses out of the stones. And when they bring the stones to the site, it's just a big pile of stone. Bricks are nice and uniform, and they piled high. And you go in there, and you see the bricks for your house, and you go, wow. You can see those nice bricks even on the pallet. You can see them as a wall. But when you look at a pile of rubbish, a pile of stones, some big, some large, some light, some dark, some pointy, some edgy, some all, and you look at that and you go, oh, my God, they're going to build my house with this mess? God said, don't worry about it because that word fitted deals with the idea of manipulating something into the right position to get it in the right place. We, too, are being fitly joined together. And, and see, as a stone, you don't know what God knows. So you might not like the stone he tucks next to you. You might not like the stone he tucked you next to. You might not like the stone he piled on top of you. But God said we too are being built together to become something that he can dwell in. And he's not using bricks. He's using stones, rocks. And he's twisting and he's turning. Sometimes he thinks he has you in place. He has to pull you out for a second, scrape a little bit of that edge off of you. Or better yet, you got just the right edge to tuck next to this other stone and close up this gap. Because this stone has an opening. This stone has a, and I can tuck you right in there. But God's the master builder. But you know what the problem in God's house is? Too many of his stones have feet. <laughs> to Kia say, amen. I saw that, Kia. See ya. Yeah, yeah, they have feet. And just when God's about to get you tucked into the right place, you want to relocate yourself. Amen, preach. You helping me. Because we are built to last. I had to move from this idea that I can make it by myself. We are built to last. But, but I need all the stones that are supposed to be around me fitly joined together. Because God said when the stones are fitly joined together, 
they rise to become a dwelling place for him. Nothing stops the Spirit of God from moving the way he wants to move than division in the church. Now, I'm not talking about the mean, nasty division. But sometimes we're not divided in bad ways, fighting and breaking down. And we're just divided in disconnection. We're just not all functioning anywhere we were meant to function. Amen, somebody. One stone does not a church make. But fitly joined together, we'll become. Amen, somebody? You helping me, preacher. Stones are uh, stones that are on a construction site but not joined and fitted into the house or into the building are in trouble. Because here's what's happening. God is putting together a building. But you know, sometimes when you have building materials laid out in the public, somebody can misunderstand or misconstrue those building materials with being debris. Because, you know, that's exactly what a stone pile looks like. It looks like somebody broke something and it needs to be moved. When, in fact, God is taking from that debris pile and building the house. Tell your neighbor, make sure you're in the house. Make sure you're in the house. I want to close with going over to 1 Peter chapter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 2. Real quick. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because I want you to get that. This is what I want you to get out of this, that we were built to last. I know I titled it you because I wanted to start with you, but I wanted to get to this collaborative and this collateral, collateral benefit. Here's what it says, 1 Peter chapter 4, or chapter 2, rather. I'm sorry, chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to read verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, talking about Jesus, Rejected by humans, but chosen by men, or chosen by God, I'm sorry, and precious to him, you also. Now, as you come to him, the living stone, talking about Jesus, rejected by men and accepted or chosen by God. Now he transitioned to us. Say us. All right. You also like living stones. You also like living stones. What are you? Living stones. Amen, somebody. It, it would be nice if God took this myoptic approach to sin. And, but he made human, the human race to be a collaborative. He made one man and one woman to produce all men and all women. It would have been nice if he could just separate Adam and Eve from Adam from Eve, Eve from Adam, and them from us. Because then we wouldn't be born in sin and shaping in iniquity. But because God made us and we to be a collaborative, what affects you affects me. Amen, somebody? <laughs> Which begs the question, when we got all of this support, look around the room. Look around. All of this support. Carrie, you've been with us for probably the whole time we've been here, 27 years. Have you ever been supported by this ministry through hard times, difficult times? Yeah. I'm the pastor, and I've been significantly supported by this ministry in hard times. I don't know what I would have done when the house burned down without this ministry. Pastor Angie got sick without this ministry. Mom died without this ministry. We're collaborative. Amen? Watch this. He says, he says now, when you come to him, the living stone, he says, you too, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You're being built into what? 
spiritual house where God lives by his spirit. One of the worst things we could do in the, in, in the church is teach individual manifestation, individual actualization of God without other people. Because then we walk around thinking, I got Jesus. I'm good. And we live our whole life having Jesus, being good, but never being good enough or good for Jesus. Because Jesus has a cause that's far beyond you. He saved you for me. He saved me for you. He saved you for us. He saved us for you. And all of us are living stones being built together to form a house. To form something that God wants to live in. Amen, somebody? Whew, watch this. You two are the living stones are being built together to form, built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? We're that building. It's important that you see your placement in the house with respect to the chief cornerstone and the other stones in the house and not as an individual stone. Amen, somebody? We are built to last. And I, and I believe that we can do great things. I believe that we can send missionaries to foreign soil. I believe that we can build uh, uh, a housing programs. I, I believe that we can impact this community in a way that wins the loss to Jesus Christ. I believe we can do that. I don't believe I can do it. Let me tell you right now, I can't do it. There's not one thing on that vision board I just gave y'all, I can do it. That's our vision. Now, we can do beyond, abundantly above what we thought we could do and what we could articulate we could do. Us together, we could blow that board away. Blow it away. But it takes us. Us together, we could fill this sanctuary. Take down those tables, put the rest of the chairs, fill it. I can't do it. You can't do it. We together can. Because the church of Jesus Christ was built to last and not break. But I want to give you this charge. Don't be a part of its breaking. It was built to last. Tiff, we were built to last. When God put us together, he made sure he put us together. You're not here because God haphazardly grabbed you off a pile and threw you against the wall. No, the Bible says you're fitly joined together. He manipulated your weird, awkward, dysfunctional, all messed up, edgy around the edges sometimes, self into the sign of the dove ministry so that he could build it up to become something great for him. And I'm the first awkward stone he put in the house. And I'm going to tell you something. He's had to scrape and chip and try to manipulate me. In. And sometimes, even while I'm in the building, I shift. You know, sometimes the building settles, things shift. He had to say, man, you shifted. I have to but I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to get displaced. Because what God built, he built to last and not break. And I'm not going to let me as an individual be a part of the breaking of what God is trying to build. We are that house. Paul gave three illustrations, but the last one was to me the most powerful. Because it talks about the fact that God is trying to build something. If you're here, and this is where God has brought you and your family, then God has you here to build something. Not just to be here. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Every head bow, every eye closed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Father, we thank you. We glorify you in this space. God, we thank you that you saved each of us. God, that you raised us up in Christ. And that as an individual, God, we are being built together to become a dwelling place for you. That each of our lives are part of something much bigger than us. That our lives are part of something that you're building for your glory. That our participation in the vision and the ministries that flow from this place are part of something great. It's not great on the scale of, 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 of comparing to other things that we see on television and other ministries, but it's great in the sense that it's going to impact other lives. So God, I, I thank you for the lives that you have brought into this place. There's not one that I would replace. There's not one that I would uh, take away. God, I thank you for the, the, the unique person that each individual is. I thank you for the gifts and the talent, so many gifts and talent in this body of people to reach the lost, God, to reach out and touch lives. So God, let us be a part of the house that you're building for yourself. He said, together we're being built to form a house that you dwell in, in our midst. So God, I pray for the individual stone. I pray, God, that no matter how tough it gets, we remain tucked away in that unique place in the house. So that we might, we might derive strength and stability from the other stones around us. But that, way, that we might also be a position or a place of support. So God, I thank you for every stone you've gathered for this house. I, pray you, I, I thank you and I praise you for the stones that we're yet to collect that are also going to be a part of the building of this house. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here today and you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to come. Salvation is free. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't require anything of you but faith. All it requires is you to to, to respond to the unction of the Holy Spirit as he draws you to Christ. He does the saving. He does the transformation, not you. All you have to do is come. If you're here and you're not giving your heart to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to come and receive him as Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you have been in this ministry and you've not made a formal declaration that this is the place God has for you, I want to open the doors of the church and give you an opportunity to come. Be a part of what God is building here, the house. Be tucked away and firmly planted in the space that he will have you. There's a space for you to occupy that I can't feel. There's a, an anointing that God has on your life that he doesn't have on my life. There's abilities and gifts and talents that he's placed in your hearts and in your minds and in your hands that he's not given to me or anybody else. And God doesn't form his church with uniformity. So I don't want you to come and be like us. I want you to come and bring another part of us. Be unique. Be you. And let God use you as he builds this house up to become 
a dwelling for himself. Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you, God, for their desire to be a part of the ministry you've called us together to accomplish. And they want to help to support the house that you're building. God, that they're unique in their giftings, they're unique in their abilities and talents. There's a measure of faith you've given them, God, for this vision. Even though you've given me the vision, you've given each of us a measure of what it takes to get it done. So, God, I thank you for their unique giftings and their unique talents, their unique abilities. I pray, God, that you bring them to bear and that we are the better because they're here. That there are things that we are now able to experience because they're here. Give Pastor Angie and I the wisdom and the insight and the anointing needed to pastor and shepherd in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you loose their gifts, their talents upon this ministry to help us grow and to become what you are making us to be. God, we thank you for them. We receive them with open arms in the name of Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Put your hands together and receive the Fitzgeralds into the ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you all. We look forward to being part of what God is doing in you all's life. Amen. Again, welcome the Fitzgeralds to the ministry. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. Are there any announcements I need to make? Yes. Come on, let's pray for Amen. So tell us a little bit about the program, Carrie. Are they in states care just through the cabinet or both cabinet and justice? Okay. Okay, so some through the cabinet, which is foster care, some through justice, which is our juvenile justice system, and some through private reasons. But most of these kids are in the program because they've been separated from their families and, um, and put into this congregate care program. And uh, she's getting ready to leave the program. And I, I can tell you how long you've been in, how long she's been in the program? Two years? Oh, I'm supposed to be 